so we are just thrilled to be joined by Dr. Enrique Sala, who is a National Geographic Explorer in Residence dedicated to restoring the health and productivity of the ocean. He's currently working to help protect the last pristine marine ecosystems worldwide and to develop new business models for marine conservation. He leads and founded National Geographic's Pristine Seas, a project that combines exploration, research, and media to inspire country leaders to protect the last wild places in the ocean. To date, they've helped create some of the largest marine reserves on the planet, covering an area well over uh, 5 million square kilometers. Enrique, it is such a pleasure to have you joining us today, and we're excited uh, to hear what you have to say about our oceans. Thank you, Joe. Pleasure to be here. Happy Biodiversity Day. Absolutely. And it has been a day, uh, Enrique. We started broadcasting live uh, just before 8 o'clock Eastern. We've gone nonstop. Uh, with events and we're going to wrap up at 9 30. We've been all over the world. We've explored the land, the ocean, lichens, uh, and everything in between. It's been a total, uh, total full spectrum event. Yeah, I've been watching and a few friends of mine have spoken before me and it's been a fantastic day. Excellent. All right, Enrique, well, I'll let you take over for a little bit and then I bet you we'll have a few questions for you. Great. Okay, hello everyone. Happy Biodiversity Day. Uh, Joe asked me to speak about the ocean. Why do we need a wild ocean? And I'd like to share my screen to show you a few things. Let me see. Okay, here we are. So I used to be a professor at the University of California. But one day I realized that all I was doing was writing the obituary of the ocean. I was describing how ocean life was declining because of fishing, pollution, climate change, but we were not doing much to, to reverse the trend. So I felt like the doctor who's telling the patient how she's going to die with a lot of detail, but not offering a cure. So I decided to quit my job as a professor and spend my entire life to help restore the health and the productivity of the ocean which I have been doing with a fantastic team. We have a National Geographic, the Pristine System. And as you said, Joe, we have been to 30 places in the last uh, 10 years, and we were able to get 22 of those protected in very large marine reserves that cover half the size of the United States. And during these 10 years, we've been to fantastic places, places where you jump in the water and you are immediately surrounded by large animals like this red snapper, one day I was diving in a tropical area in the Central Pacific and I noticed somebody pulling me on a ponytail. And I thought it was my Alan Friedlander, who's a very funny when he's diving. And I turned around and I saw this guy. Um, so these are places where there are very few people. These are the closest to, to pristine that we have left in the ocean. And these are places that are full of large predators. This is what you would expect when you dive in a reef that has not been fished, full of sharks. Sometimes you jump in the water and as soon as your bubbles clear, you, uh, you find yourself surrounded by sharks. This is in Cocos Island National Park, a place where at night there is a daily spectacle of nature, 100, about 100 white reef, reef, uh, white tip reef sharks hunt you know, like a wolf a pack hunt for small fishes in the, in the reef. And it's a spectacular thing that you can see almost nowhere else. We have been diving also in extraordinary underwater forests that look like cathedrals. This is a giant kelp forest in the Diego Ramirez Islands. I thought that Cape Horn was the southernmost point of the Americas, but when we were there a couple of years ago on an expedition with Pristine Seas, we realized that there were a couple of small islands 60 miles southwest of Cape Horn. So that's the, the southernmost land between um, the Americas and Antarctica. And we had a very good window of good weather for a couple of days. So we went down there and we were able to dive in some of the most spectacular kelp forests on the planet. These plants are the fastest growing plant in the ocean and on the planet, only second to, to bamboo. You can, if you are patient enough, you can see them grow. Uh, it's about a foot a day that they can grow. And this is one of my favorites. This is in a Millennium Atoll, an untouched coral reef that belongs to Kiribati in the Central Pacific near the equator. And this is what a coral reef should look like. 
a place where the bottom is full of living, thriving coral and the water is full of predators. However, we have also seen degraded places on our trips, on our expeditions around the world. This used to be a coral reef, also on the Line Islands in Kiribati. Now it's a graveyard. You can only see turf, algae, seaweed growing and slime growing on top of dead coral skeletons. And um, this is not just uh, in the coral reefs. This has happened every, all around the world. We reached peak fish 24 years ago which means that in the mid 90s, the global fishing catch started declining. About two thirds of the fish stocks are experiencing overfishing, which means that we are catching more fish. We're catching fish faster than they can reproduce. And if we continue like this, most commercial fisheries could collapse by 2050. However, there are solutions and we have seen some of these solutions work and it's spectacular. One solution is to fish less. As I said, we are the global fishing catch is going down. So going after the fish with more boats, more effort is not going to make us catch more fish. The fishing industry say, oh, well, we need to fish more because we will have to feed 10 billion people soon. However, you know, if the, the fisheries are declining worldwide, how are we going to catch more fish if we continue fishing more and more? So that's one thing we need to fix. We need to reduce fishing effort, ideally reduce the capacity, the number of boats in the ocean. We have too many boats catching uh, too, too few fish. And uh, the other thing we can do, and this is what I like to focus on now, it's what we call marine protected areas. These are equivalent of national parks in the sea. These are areas that are fully protected, ideally fully protected from fishing, and other extractive activities like oil drilling or mining. And I, I love to show this example of what happens when we protect the place. This is a place in Mexico, in Cabo Pulmo, in Baja California. With my friend and colleague Octavio Aburto, we did a trip throughout the Sea of Cortez, the Gulf of California. And one of the places where we stopped was Cabo Pulmo. And we measured the abundance of marine life there, including the fish. And as you can see in this photo, there is not much here. In the mid nineties, the fishermen, the local fishermen were so upset with not, with not having enough fish to catch that they did something that nobody expected. Instead of going after the last few fish left, they decided to ask the Mexican government to create a no take marine reserve, a national park in the sea. When we return 10 years later, this is what we saw. That was before and after, it's the same place. We saw it come back to pristine in only 10 years. What had been an underwater desert is now a kaleidoscope of light and color. And we saw everything come back, everything, including the large predators like the groupers, sharks and jacks. This is one of the most spectacular recoveries ever measured in the, in the ocean. So this shows that if we pro fully protect places, we can bring all of the biodiversity back, everything from the small to the large. And you know who else is thriving in Cabo Pulmo? The fishermen, those visionary fishermen who now are making more money from diving tourism inside the reserve. But also these reserves help to replenish the fish populations around them. What we have seen, this miracle from Cabo Pulmo, we have seen all over the world. When you have a fully protected area that is well managed, the fish come back spectacularly. And on average, the biomass of fish inside this reserve is 600% larger than outside. Not only there are more than six times more fish, but also the fish, go, the fish grow larger. And that means that they produce a disproportionately larger amount of eggs. But then they are transported by the currents outside of the reserve. And many of these fish also spill over the boundaries of the reserve. So the fishermen are having better livelihoods. They are catching more fish. They are catching more fish per hour spent at sea. Their incomes are increasing. So these marine reserves are like savings account that have a principle that we set aside that produces growth with compound interest and produces returns that all, we all can enjoy. Um, 
diving is diving tourism is another example of the benefits of these reserves the more biodiversity you have the more species the more schools of large fish the more people will want to see this one a great example is the great barrier reef in marine park in australia of which a third is fully protected in 2017 about 56,000 jobs were supported by ecotourism and ecotourism, diving, marine tourism, brought $5 billion to the Australian economy. That's almost 40 times more revenue than fishing. So we can bring this wonderful biodiversity back. Not only fisheries improve and there are new economic opportunities and jobs created because of the tourism that increases after a place is protected, but also if we are able to protect coastal marine habitats like coral reefs, seagrass beds and mangroves. If, this, if these habitats are intact and have the ability to grow, they also provide an essential service. They are insurance for coastal communities because they are able to attenuate the destructive power of storm surges or hurricane cyclone storms. So this, uh, you know, uh, by marine biodiversity is key for, for human well-being but also for our health, because uh, we have seen that degraded ecosystems, degraded marine ecosystems where we, ha we have destroyed the corals or the um, kelps, or we have reduced the abundance of sponges or oysters, which filter the water and keep it clean. Coastal areas where we have degraded these ecosystems are more likely to experience harmful algal blooms and fish kills which means that sometimes the fisheries have to be closed. People cannot eat seafood because it's toxic. And some of these closures last as long as 35 years. So marine biodiversity is not only something beautiful and intrinsically um, necessary for the planet, but also it produces food, it creates jobs, and it uh, is a source of economic revenue for, for many countries. Now, how much of the ocean is protected? If these marine protected areas that bring back biodiversity are so extraordinary and have so many social, economic, and ecological benefits, how much of the ocean is protected today? Well, today, only 7% of the ocean is in areas that have been designated or proposed as protected areas. And only 2.5% of the ocean is in fully protected areas that experience this recovery that we have seen in Cabo Pulmo. If we have only 7% and only 2.5% is fully protected, how much we need? There is agreement among scientists that we need to have half of the planet in natural state and use the other half responsibly if we are to prevent the extinction of a million species worldwide land and sea, if we are to prevent the collapse of our life support system, and if we are to fulfill to achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. And we can start by agreeing to protect 30% of the planet, 30% of the ocean, 30% of, of the land in these protected areas. So this is uh, something that people have been talking about for many, many years, but now with the COVID, uh, with, the, with the pandemic, we see this is the, you know, the loudest wake up call. And I know that other, other presenters today have been talking about that already, but you know, I think we cannot uh, repeat it enough. This pandemic is the loudest wake up call for humanity, is the strongest reminder that we are not isolated for nature and that our fate is closely linked with the health of the natural world. More biodiversity means more benefits for humans, including reducing the risk of pandemics. We can get cholera from a coastal area on a warm year if we have killed the oysters or the giant clams and cleaned the water because the bacteria that produce cholera are, are found on the sea, right? We can get a global pandemic affecting not only individual lives, but the entire global economy it takes just one person, one person getting in touch with one infected animal in one part of the world and with our modern globalized lifestyle, boom, we have a pandemic. 
So right now, you know, we are privileged because we live here in the United States. I live in Washington, D.C., the capital of, of the United States. And we are privileged that we have to be at home, but we are safe. Many other people are, are suffering. And, but my fate and your fate, Joe, and, and the fate of you who is watching is linked to the poorest person in the poorest country of the world. You know, saying that, well, individual actions don't really matter. Well, they do. Right? We are all connected. And not only to 7 billion people, but we are connected to billions of individuals of 9 million species of plants and animals and a trillion type, different types of microbes, plus probably 10 times more different types of viruses. Many of these viruses are good. Viruses in the ocean help kill bacteria that would infect and kill corals. In the same way, we have viruses in our in the mucous membrane linings of our reproductive, our digestive respiratory systems. They help us. Uh, they help us against bacteria that would be harmful to human health. So they are part, some of these viruses are part of our natural immune system. So we are living on this planet with the, all these creatures in the ocean, on the land, in the atmosphere, and we are part of it. And what we have learned from our own studies in the ocean is that the more biodiversity there is, the more benefits we get, and the lower the risk of uh, food security shortages, destruction of coastal habitats, uh, destruction of coastal communities, and also um, uh, an increase in, uh, in, in human health. So this is why we need a wild ocean. All right. Thank you so much, Enrique. That was such a a great presentation and just lays out the evidence for, uh, you know, how important biodiversity is for us and how if we give some space, uh, how quickly life can recover. You know, we had Rodrigo Medellin joining us this morning from Mexico, and he talked about the bats. And it really just comes down to education. You know, the, what we're experiencing right now is not an, an animal disease. It's, it's a human disease. It's being spread, um, you know, uh, through, through our contact. And the reason why it's happening is habitat loss and being more close in contact with animals and things like that. So this message couldn't be more important. And this is a wake up call because what's potentially looming in the future uh, is gonna make this look like, you know, brighter days maybe. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, mo most people believe that this is just an issue of terrestrial land ecosystems. Of course, this uh, coronavirus, the reservoir species uh, is a uh, horseshoe bat in China. Right? And yeah. it probably jumped from bats to probably pangolins and, and then to us. But we have, it's not just uh, this COVID. No? Today is COVID. Yesterday it was SARS, MERS, Ebola, rabies. Even H I HIV came from chimpanzees. So, you know, it, it's not this thing. It, it, it has happened many times before. And it will happen in the future unless we change our ways, unless we change our broken relationship with nature. And protected areas is a very simple way. It is proven that it produces all these benefits. Because if we protect areas on land and sea, not only we will reduce the risk of contact with this um, with animals that can carry a virus that can infect us, but also biodiversity dilutes uh, disease. So the more animals, the, the more complex the food web, the less likely it is that uh, one animal that is infected will increase in, in numbers. And, and infect humans at first contact. This happens usually in degraded areas around human settlements. But also, pro these protected areas provide multiple benefits. On, in, on the land, they help us produce oxygen, create rain. The Amazon forest creates its own rain, its own weather system, uh, pollination for our crops. And I saw and Rodrigo talking about the bats that pollinate the, the tequila plants, you know, the agave plants that produce tequila. So lots of people are, are happy about that and they want the bats to continue doing their job. These ecosystems help to prevent floods. Uh, they sequester much of the carbon pollution that we throw in the atmosphere. In the case of the ocean, we, they produce food because a big difference between the ocean and the land is that the biggest driver of loss of biodiversity on the land is, is the conversion of forest and grasslands into agriculture or pasture. But in the ocean, it's climate change and historically the most important has been extraction of biomass, extraction of wildlife. Because fishing is not like uh, cultivating the land. 
Fishing is the, large, the last large scale hunting operation on the planet. Fish are wildlife, you know, we call it seafood. But you know, there are, we're, we're catching hundreds and hundreds of species in, of fish and invertebrates from the ocean. It's like, you know, when we eat some animal, we, we call mammal and all of them, we put goats and pigs and uh, cows and, and sheep, we put them all in, in the mammal category without distinguishing what it is, right? So that it, when it comes to the ocean, not only we know much less about the ocean than we know about the land, but also the, it, we see it as something that doesn't belong to our human world, which is mostly terrestrial, right? It, whatever happens under the surface, you know, people have no idea. So we get all that stuff, but it, it's hunting. You know, we are eating wild animals from the ocean. And if you eat an animal that has been swimming in an, in a, in an algal bloom, in a harmful algal bloom, you can get sick and die, you know? So we need to be careful not to, you know, we need to uh, ban global wildlife trade uh, to prevent the risk of future pandemics on the land. But also we need to be very, very careful about what within the ocean because we have already seen examples of, of disease, outbreaks of disease in coastal areas or outbreaks and incidents of and respiratory diseases, the asthma, for example, in the Florida, in the Florida Keys, also because of uh, harmful algal blooms that were fostered by the degradation of the marine ecosystem. So, again, our health, our survival, every one of us is depends on having a healthy environment, and we need to commit to 30% of the ocean and the land protected by 2030. Absolutely, no question. I want to shift gears a little bit, Enrique, and talk about your team. You've assembled just an incredible team from all over the world that head out on these expeditions. I've been able to host them in different spots like Colombia and the Azores. And it's absolutely incredible to see the skill set, the way they work together. What is it like to get out on one of these expeditions for two to three weeks and work with a team like that? Yeah, well, I'm very lucky that they let me be part of the team. They are extraordinary. We have people who on our pristine system and National Geographic, we have people who work on operations, on expeditions, diving safety and medical uh, or organizing the logistics of, of the expedition we have scientists we have uh, filmmakers experts in policy experts in communications and then i uh, i just do what they tell me and uh it's it is fantastic going in one of these expeditions is like a dream when i was a little kid i was watching the documentaries of jacques Cousteau on tv and my dream was to be a diver in the Calypso, in Cousteau's famous boat, and go around the world and, and explore the ocean. And we are doing it now. Uh, so in this expedition, we get a team, our core team of uh, expedition leader, uh, diving safety officer, scientists, and filmmakers. And wherever we go, we always bring local scientists, local experts, or rep representatives of local communities to go with us, because of course they have a some of these places where we go, there is nobody. Nobody has done much much science there. But in many cases, you know, we we look we work with local experts, and it, it's like a dream come true. You wake up in the morning, have breakfast, prepare the cameras or the scientific gear, you do the first dive, get out of the water, move to the next place on the small boat, uh, wait for an hour, do another dive, come back to the boat, uh, clean. Uh, get a new uh, new slate or change the batteries of the cameras, have lunch, uh, maybe take a little nap, then go out again for the third dive of the day. And then when we come back after two or three dives, having seen all these wonderful things, we enter the data in the computers and back, up, back them up on drives, uh, edit the photographs, download the, the video onto our drives. And then we have uh, dinner and uh, a review of the day. And we plan for the day after. We have always something that we inherited from Paul Rose, uh, a big whiteboard and always making the plan for the day after. And we go to bed absolutely exhausted, but so happy that we have been able to, is that, that good, good tired. Uh, it's, we are so privileged to be in these places and be able to document them and, and be able to measure and communicate to the world how healthy they are and how important it is to protect them. So, you know, you do this for two, three, four, five weeks. So it's like, we are like little kids on, on, an, uh, on an adventure, right? And we are very lucky that we can do this three or four times per year. Yeah, absolutely amazing. So speaking of the footage you're collecting, you're in there collecting media. Um, 
then you, you put it together and you can share it with the leaders of those countries so they can see what they have in their waters. How satisfying is it to see their faces when they see that footage? Yeah, their faces. That's what, you know, most, most, of, most people have not been to the places we have been to. And even we have been to some remote island communities where they depend on, on the sea for their, for their living, but they are not divers or they don't have the, the ability. And sometimes we dive deep with a, with a submersible. So we always, we learn a lot from them. We uh, decide where to go based on their knowledge saying you are going to find these species here or our spawning aggregation of groupers there, etc. But we always bring things back that they have never seen. Not because we are cool, but because they haven't been un underwater. They, they, you know, mostly fishing from the surface. And their faces are like, wow. And is this here? Do we have this weird animal here? I cannot believe it. It's it, it, it a phase of first surprise, then fascination, and then admiration and love. Because the most important thing is to see how these people, local communities and presidents alike, they all fall in love with these places because humans are inherently attracted to nature, wild nature. So when you can bring them diving with you or in the submersible, we have done that in the past, and you know, that's uh, they fall in love immediately. If they cannot join us because they have busy schedules, then we bring the place to them with our with our films and and short videos. Sometimes the, we are we show them a, you know one minute clip on on my iPad just to give them a teaser, and their faces absolutely. The first thing that they do is com be, feel fall completely in love with these places. Everybody becomes like a little kid when you take them into to wild nature. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. The work, what it's accomplished. And, you know, it all started with taking that leap, realizing that you weren't accomplishing what you wanted to, and then taking that, that risk. It may have seemed like a huge daunting task. I think people sometimes talk themselves out of doing things like that, but look what can happen when you just jump in with both feet, um, with good science, a good crew, you know, a sign of a good leader is seeing who you have and letting them do their thing. And it seems to me like you've got that down to a science. Well, the trick is to have uh, people on your team who are much smarter than you and are much better at what they do than you. And, you know, I, I yeah, I just let them do, do the work. They are amazing. And I'm very, very privileged to be, to be part of this team at uh, National Geographic. All right. Well, we're going to continue this conversation a little bit more tomorrow when we bring expedition leader Paul Rose in for an event to end our day, our busy day, Saturday uh, tomorrow. So, don't miss that. Uh, people who are tuning in, it's going to be a good one. This has been like an ocean triple header. I just hosted Emma in Australia talking about corals. We just had a great conversation about the work you're doing. And I've got Brad Norman waiting in the waiting room. We're going to talk whale sharks now. So uh, kind of like Australia, you're sandwiched in between the Aussies. Uh, tonight. <laughs> I, I love not Brad. I haven't seen him in a while, but thank you so much for having me. Happy Biodiversity Day, everybody. All right. Thanks so much, Enrique. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thank you.